Chapter 14. Caught in the Meat Grinder. Once at Heroville, I received a hearty welcome and first checked my platoon's positions. My men had been anything but lazy during my absence. They had worked on camouflaging our vehicles and digging their foxholes deeper. In the last couple days, there had been no enemy ground attacks in this sector. Still, I could make out new bomb craters around the bridge, and the houses of Eroville had to suffer a lot. Slowly but steadily, our surroundings transformed into a continuous crater landscape. Enemy artillery fire intensified day by day. They must have brought additional light and heavy batteries into position in the meantime. This, along with their cruisers and battleships' main guns, gave them overwhelming firepower. While I was on my round, the first intense bombardment happened already. Judging by the different kinds of detonations I could hear, the British were using several different calibers against us. Funnel-shaped geysers of soil and smoke shot up in the air, leaving behind huge craters all around. Eventually, I returned to the command post. A surprise was waiting for me there. Bratz, together with some soldiers I did not know, had arrived. These men introduced themselves as German Kampfschwimmer. Frogmen. Frogmen, I thought. I had expected anything but this kind of reinforcement. Up to that point, I had not even known that such a unit existed within our ranks. Bratz and I briefed these men on the situation around the bridges between Heroville and Colombelle. Just like me, they had been present during the latest artillery strike and were visibly harried by the experience. The reason for their presence, as they explained, were the bridges over the Orne and Caen Canal. On June 6, 1944, attempts to defend or recapture the bridges at Benouville had failed, and multiple Luftwaffe sorties to destroy them had also been unsuccessful. This meant that from the first day of the invasion, a steady stream of Allied supplies could cross the waterways. In addition, the British had begun construction of pontoon bridges over the Orne and Caen Canal, which would allow for even more supplies, large guns, and most of all, tanks to reinforce the British airborne east of the river. Our frogmen were now tasked with putting an end to these machinations. Pegasus Bridge and the nearby Orne Bridge were the largest and thus most important. They were to be destroyed in a commando operation. They had arrived with two trucks carrying torpedo-like explosive devices to blow up these bridges. Their plan was to form two groups of three men each, who would dive into the canal and the river at night, swimming past us and towards the bridges with their explosive charges. Once there, the charges were to be planted under the bridges. This risky endeavour was to be carried out tonight already, between June 22 and 23. The bomb timers were set to detonate in the early morning. Right after our briefing, the frogmen headed out and left our sector. I was awestruck. Such an operation had been the last thing I had expected. Nevertheless, I admired these men for their bravery. I ordered my men to wake me at 05 socks in the morning before sinking into a deep sleep, completely exhausted. In the morning of June 23rd, we waited eagerly to hear anything about the detonations. Much as usual, we lay in our positions in the early hours, watching the terrain ahead. All of a sudden, a loud detonation tore through the silence, and behind us, at the nearby bridge, a huge pillar of water rose from the Cayenne Canal. Utterly surprised, we watched from our dugouts as the bridge behind our line collapsed with a loud crash. Then the water came back down, spraying the riverbanks. Baffled, we looked at each other wondering. There had been no sign of aircraft or incoming shells. Had the frogmen ended up attacking the wrong bridge? We went to the site and looked at the result. The bridge was completely destroyed, and we were cut off from the rest of our company. Many years after the war, I found out what actually happened. The six German frogmen of Marineinsatz Kommando, 65, 65th Naval Special Operations Group, had entered the waters at night just as they had planned. Each of the two groups carried one of the explosive charges. The first problems arose when these heavy, torpedo-like devices, which were built for use in salt water, did turn out to have little buoyancy in the river water, and thus sank to the bottom. As such, the charges had to be arduously balanced with empty gas canisters strapped onto them. After this had been achieved, the frogmen began their approach around midnight. The first group soon had more problems when a few of the gas canisters were lost, leading to the bomb sinking again. 
Eventually, they were forced to have one man carry it on his shoulders while crawling through the mud at the river bottom, an extremely tedious process, as the men had to surface regularly to breathe. In the end, this group still managed to plant its charge and swim back. The other group also had enough challenges of its own. One of the three men lost his nerves and returned to land, leaving the other two to continue the mission on their own. But they too managed to plant their charge under the bridge. When the river's current proved to be too strong to swim back, they were forced to wait for the entire day before climbing out of the water in the evening, running west and entering the Khan Canal. There, against the slower current, they swam back towards Khan. Both explosive charges detonated at 05.30, as planned. It was not the bridges at Benouville and Ronville, however, which were destroyed, but our bridges at Herouville and Colombelle, the two bridges that were still in German hands. What the largest British naval guns and countless bomber sorties had been unable to accomplish in weeks, the German Wehrmacht had achieved itself in a single night. When the cause for this was investigated, it turned out that the frogmen had been given outdated maps. In order to succeed, they had needed to pass two other bridges before planting their explosives on the third. Due to these incomplete maps, however, both groups had only passed one bridge before blowing up the ones they had come across next, which were, of course, those still in our possession. There had been no casualties except one. The frogman who had lost his nerves earlier had grown worried about his comrades, entering the water again in hopes of finding them on their return. After some time, he had been spotted by British guards, coming under fire and getting wounded. He had managed to leave the water, but died of his wounds shortly thereafter. The successful destruction of the Normandy bridges was the first German frogman mission of World War II. After almost four weeks of continuous frontline duty, it was decided that 21, Panzer Division was to be withdrawn from the area north of Caen. Casualties had amassed up to a point where some of its companies were down to no more than 25 men, less than what a platoon of that same company should have. The main battle line north of Caen was severely undermanned. Time and again, units were regrouped, with individual battalions being brought forward in alternation. Our own Chai Battalion, now completely deployed at Eruville and Colombelle, had shrunk to around half its original strength. By early July, Panzer Regiment 22 had 52 Panzer Raffars and 7 Panzer Threes remaining. The support units of artillery and combat engineers were in a similar state. Up to that point, almost 3,000 men of 21. Panzer Division had been wounded or killed. Consequently, from June 29th onwards, our division was relieved by 16. Luftwaffen Fell Division Luftwaffe Field Division. In the process, we also received a new battalion commander, Major Leopold Lentz. On July 7th, another enemy frontal attack on Caen was attempted from the north. This time, the preliminary bombardment was carried out in large parts by strategic bomber wings, German soldiers of 16. Luftwaffen Fell Division were soon forced to retreat, but all the rubble in the northern part of the town hindered any further advance. British and Canadian tanks could not hope to overcome the mountains of debris towering before them. Over the course of July 8th, only one kilometre, one one hundred wides, of ground was gained. By July 10th, eventually, the town centre and Orne River were reached. Here, the attackers halted again. They had managed to capture the northern and western parts of Caen, while the town's east, as well as the Colombelles area, remained in our hands. At first, we did not hear much about the events unfolding. Our company marched towards Mondeville in the night between July 6th and 7th, where the battalion was to receive replacements, our own eight. Company was quite banged up, having suffered heavy casualties from the unrelenting artillery strikes of the week before. It was down to roughly 75% of its original strength. Me and my men had been among the luckiest. Our anti-tank platoon still had all its vehicles, and no more than two of my men were killed by artillery. Due to the constant threat of low-level air attacks, I had requisitioned a motorcycle for myself. Driving this smaller vehicle made me feel much safer compared to riding in the bulkier Kubelwagen. Back in Africa, I had raced around in a sidecar motorcycle for months. As such, I was more comfortable with this vehicle, 
a heavy BMW. In the evening of July 7th, I was on my way to a briefing at the company command post. All of a sudden, I felt a massive shockwave passing by my head. A fountain of rocks and soil shot up in the middle of the road around a hundred feet ahead. Half benumbed by the blast, I swerved with my bike into the roadside ditch, lying down with my heart pounding wildly. As a matter of fact, an artillery shell had passed by my head to the right and impacted right in front of me. If the shell had come in just a few inches further left, I would have kept going on the road without a head for a moment. I listened for additional detonations, but could hear none. I looked at the road. On the other side, around 130 feet down the road, there was a steep hillside in which I could make out a few holes. These were hideouts of French civilians, similar to ones I had already seen near Herouville. Behind them, it was possible to get a view all the way to the ridge north of Herouville. Had I been spotted from there, leading to an attempt to score a lucky hit on me, I could not know. In any case, I had been lucky. I pulled my motorcycle out of the ditch and kept going, trying not to think about having cheated death yet another time. When the situation north of Calm became dire on July 8th, the alarm was given for us as well. Our Panzer Grenadier Regiment 192 was to assemble in the Eruville area in preparation for a counterattack into the northwest. There, the 16. Luftwaffenfeld Division had already suffered 75% casualties. Several companies from both battalions of Panzer Grenadier Regiment 192, including our 8 Company, along with several Panzers of Panzer Regiment 22, were sent to Herouville. Fortunately, there were dense clouds and soft rain that day, which meant that we were not harassed by ground attack aircraft. Under difficult conditions, we crossed the Orne River over a railroad bridge and then the Khan Canal over a road bridge northwest of Mondeville. Then we established a temporary beachhead. The attack was to commence in the earliest hours of July 9th, shortly after midnight. There, heavy fighting already took place between the British and units of 16, Luftwaffenfeld Division, as we could clearly hear by the noise of battle ahead. The situation became less and less clear, however, leading to the attack being suspended. For the time being, all we could do was wait. During reconnaissance of the near area, I found an orphaned 75mm Puck 40 gun, which I immediately let hook up on one of my self-propelled guns. It used the same ammunition as my guns, and you could never know. Maybe we might need it in the future. At 08 Harli Yam in the morning of July 9th, the order came for all to move back behind the Orne. So we marched back again. In bright daylight and without clouds in the sky, this truly was a par force run. All kept looking up, but nothing happened. Not a single fighter bomber showed up. We took up a position in the town center of Cannes at the Oran River's southern bank. I was appalled to see the state that the town was in already. All of it had been turned to rubble. Moving through the streets was almost impossible. We waited in our concealed positions, and in the afternoon of July 9th, our company attempted another advance further into Caen. The enemy had already occupied the town center. However, and after an intense meeting engagement, we withdrew. The bridges we had crossed earlier were blown up by combat engineers. With that, the northern and central parts of Caen were now in Allied hands once and for all. After another night in the old positions, we took up new ones to the south of the, now destroyed, railroad bridge northwest of Mondeville on July 10th. There, we remained for the time being, hidden in the debris, dammed to immobility thanks to the threat posed by Allied aircraft. To our left, at Cayenne, the 272. Infantry division went into position over the following days, and our 20 from 20 war. Panzer division occupied the area from Mondeville over Colombelle up to Demouville, further in the rear. To the east, around Couverville and Touffeville, 16. Luftwaffenfeld Division took up new positions. On July 18, 1944, the brief calm was over for us. The British now commenced their decisive attack, Operation Goodwood. It began with a bombardment, the likes of which we had never witnessed before. Such was its intensity that those who would survive it would never be able to forget it.
We lay in our holes at Mondeville during the usual morning shift, when shortly before 06 Dallas, a buzzing sound heralded the approach of bomber aircraft. The next thing we heard was the howling of bombs plummeting to the ground before they detonated with a loud crash. Gigantic mushroom clouds rose up and started floating over the terrain ahead. Everyone tried to get as much cover as possible. The air was filled with unbelievable thunder and banging. It seemed as if the world was coming to an end. We had no choice but to endure the entire bombardment in impotent helplessness. Time passed by, but the hellish spectacle continued unabated. All of that, and we were not even in the epicenter of this bombardment. Its main focus lay on a long sector stretching from Colombelles over Cuverville up to Toufreville in the north and Cany in the south. We at Mondeville were at the edge of the target zone. We could watch as the British lead bombers dropped flares and waves over waves of following aircraft unloaded their bombs. Impact after impact, the bombardment slowly rolled from north to south. Houses disappeared in flashing explosions, and trees were hurled into the sky. An impenetrable wall of smoke, dust, and detonations formed. When the bombs detonated as close as roughly a hundred yards ahead of our line, we thought that our end had come. But then the inferno suddenly stopped, only to make room for the next firestorm. After the bombs and artillery had gone silent, we looked around in our positions. Once again we had been lucky. My platoon was unharmed. The company as a whole had lost one vehicle. A self-propelled anti-aircraft gun had been destroyed by a close bomb hit. The vehicle, which had been dug in almost five feet into the ground, had been hurled up by the blast along with its crew. Rowley seventy feet away from its original position, it had come down again, now lying on its back. We grew bitter. We wanted to fight our enemy face to face, but before we got a chance we were shattered by his bombs and shells. Ahead of us, in the direction of Colombelles, we could already hear intense battle noise. Bratz and I decided to work our way towards the edge of Mondeville in order to inspect the area around the Columbella's industrial grounds. Just as we had arrived, we spotted British tanks east of us, going southwards, in a widely spread formation. We watched some of them getting hit, and explode. At the industrial grounds ahead, where most of the companies of our the two battalion were positioned, there was fierce fighting. We could hear bursts of British submachine gun fire. Bratz and I returned to our command post and resolved to employ my anti-tank platoon at Guyberville, advancing in the direction of Couverville. We intended for this move to create a flanking position that prevented the enemy tanks from encircling us. I gave the according orders to my men, and with the three self-propelled guns, we slowly felt our way forward. On the way ahead, the terrain soon became more open, so I let the vehicles take turns in driving forward one by one. All the time artillery shells kept whistling by, and far to the east we could see multiple columns of smoke indicating a raging battle. One of my guns drew forward over open ground. They were only around 200 yards ahead. Suddenly the impacts around the vehicle dramatically increased in number. We have been spotted, flashed through my mind. But the gun's commander did not recognize the danger. I loudly cursed the missing radio equipment. My runner recognized the danger just as I had and before I knew it, he jumped off the vehicle and hurried towards the gun in the open. All watched him tensely. It seemed as if he would reach it. Only a few steps separated him from the vehicle. All of a sudden, it got a direct hit. The gun, its crew and the runner all vanished in an explosion. Debris flew in all directions, and bright red flames emerged, followed by thick, oily smoke. Now everything happened fast. More impacts splashed up soil around us. Artillery, or worse, enemy AT. I ordered to reverse. The engine was revved up, and we moved back into the cover of some bushes. There was no going forward here. The wreck was smouldering on the open field ahead. In the blink of an eye, I had lost six soldiers. All of them burned up in the explosion. Their faces flashed through my mind. I was shocked by this sudden and unexpected loss. We turned back. Bratz. A few grenadiers and I attempted to scout northwards on foot. It was afternoon by now, and we received a message from battalion command stating that the enemy had begun crossing the Orne at Khan. Now our position was a risky one. We worked our way forward towards Couverville. The terrain was filled with huge craters making it difficult to cross. 
We eventually reached the Colombelles industrial grounds and took cover next to one of the workshops. We knew that our battalion was fighting here but saw none of our soldiers. Just as we raised our heads a bit to see further, the wall behind us started spitting. Chunks of cement sprinkled down as MG bullets hit the building. Directly ahead, in the ruins roughly 220 feet away, I could spot the typical bowl helmets of our enemy. We had to cut and run. Covering each other, we hurried back. Alternately leaping and crawling, we crossed an open area and found ourselves back in Guyberville. We looked at our watches, late afternoon. Our situation was completely incalculable. I hurried to my remaining two guns and withdrew them back to the edge of Montville. We received a radio call by the battalion commander, ordering to withdraw to Montville. The positions at Colombelles had become untenable. Canadian infantry began crossing the Orne with assault boats, and strong enemy forces were on the advance southwards out of Colombelles, meaning they were headed directly towards us. To our east bustled the British tanks. The situation seemed hopeless. Finally, in the evening, we heard the desperate radio call from our major to regimental command. Two battalion encircled at Mondeville. We fight to the last. Long live the Führer, Sieg Heil. Bratz and I were shocked. That radio call took away our breath, and it seemed as if a heavy burden was now put on our shoulders. I could sense a feeling of trepidation taking hold of me. Is this how it ends? I thought desperately. The radio operator looked at us eyes wide open. I refused to accept this. I did not fancy entering captivity here, or even dying for the Führer. There had to be a way out. There always was. I adjured Bratz to let us attempt a breakout, on our own account if necessary. I was determined that we could make it. We both had seen that, to our southeast, multiple British tanks had been taken out, which meant that there had to be one of our units nearby. So I proposed that we should attempt to break out to the southeast. Me and my two self-propelled guns would form the vanguard. If we were to carefully work our way southward after nightfall, it could succeed. During that time, the British artillery observers would be practically blind. I could see our men tensely listening to our conversation. They knew it was do or die now. Breakout, captivity, or death. All or nothing. So, I scouted ahead with my two self-propelled guns along the railroad from Guyberville to Grentherville, and from there onward, towards Freneville. After several hundred yards of advancing alternately, my gunner spotted an armoured vehicle in a railroad underpass, roughly 300 yards straight ahead, apparently a British Cromwell tank. We had a shaped charge shell in the breach, and so I immediately ordered to open fire. The first shot scored a direct hit. A cloud of smoke rose from the tank. With my binoculars, I intently examined the area. I found nothing else. I gave the order to keep advancing slowly. The tension was at its maximum, but the danger of getting encircled made us throw all caution to the wind. After some time we had closed in on the tank, and to our relief we discovered that it had already been destroyed. The crew had escaped the vehicle but not made it. Smoke was still rising from the burnt corpses lying around the wreck. When we slowly went on, we spotted two more British tanks, this time Sherman's. They were burnt up as well. By now we had covered quite some distance and had a free view towards Canny. It looked as if the armoured assault had indeed been defeated. We quickly returned to Mondeville, and I reported our findings to Bratz. He radioed our battalion commander who, with audible desperation in his voice, decided to risk a breakout attempt. The Canadians and British were drawing closer by the minute, and to Mayolens this was the only possibility to contribute anything to the rescue of his battalion. Contrary to his earlier message, he seemed to gather courage again. Dusk had already set in, and after some short regrouping, we commenced the breakout. I was at the tip, followed by the rest of our company, and finally the battalion after it. In a long stretched column, and staggered to the side, we drove southeast. Time and again, I ordered to halt and scanned the terrain ahead. The area was brightly lit by a multitude of fires. Wrecks of British tanks appeared in the distance. We expected to run into massive enemy tank or anti-tank fire at any moment. My nerves were strained to breaking point. If I was to lead our battalion into an ambush, it would be our end. A surprising opening of fire would mean our demise. Now, in the middle of the night, 
it would be a bitter fight to the last, and we would certainly be the ones to lose it. After several miles of driving through the night, we suddenly came across a single soldier directly ahead, raising his hand. I rose mine as well, and much to my relief I recognized the shape of his helmet, signifying that it was one from our side. We had established contact with our regiment. When the rest of our battalion started arriving bit by bit, there was much surprise. After the last radio call, they had not expected to see us again. Lieutenant Colonel Rauch appeared and congratulated us on our successful breakout. Major Lenz praised my initiative, and Rauch acknowledged it appreciatively. The regiment was now united again, albeit rumpled by the fighting. Rauch informed us about the defensive victory that our troops had achieved over the course of the day. To our relief we realized that the line could be held for the time being. The entirety of 21. Panzer Division was now to be pulled back and shifted east to Troan that same night. The positions in this area would be taken over by 12. SS Panzer Division, Hitler Youth. We had arrived in the middle of the preparations for this takeover. We came just at the right time. We lined up with the regiment and immediately went on the march southeast. After roughly four miles, having passed Vermont and heading towards Argence, we made halt in a small village. We covered up our vehicles and camouflaged them. This was, after all these long weeks, the first opportunity for us to knock ourselves in shape a bit. In one of the houses we found a bathtub and some water, which we used to get some thorough cleaning. Further orders would come in only by next morning. I took stock of my platoon. My anti-tank platoon had two self-propelled guns remaining along with a French truck and my Kubelwagen. Of my originally 21 men, 13 were still alive. So, together with me, my platoon consisted of 14 men. This meant that I had lost around a third of my unit. Eight of my soldiers had fallen. I had two full gun crews of five men and three men for the truck, one of which I now assigned my new runner. Not a desirable position since, apart from the gun crew which had been killed by the artillery hit, all other losses, including Atenada, had been my runners. I also took one soldier from one of the gun crews to drive my Kubelwagen. As for me, I decided to directly ride along with one of the SPGs. Riding on the gun carrier would give me a better overview of any situation we could find ourselves in. In the morning of July 19th, I tried to find out where we had ended up. We were roughly two and a half miles south of Troan, in the village of Lefresne. We had orders to take up defensive positions between saint Père and Troan within the next couple hours. To our left was Panzer Grenadier Regiment 125. To our right, 346. Infantry Division. In the west, there were a large number of British tank wrecks strewn across a large open area. Those I wanted to take a closer look at. Perhaps one of them was still serviceable and, with some luck, could reinforce my platoon to full strength. I told my men about this plan, who acknowledged it with more or less enthusiasm. They knew me well, and I had gained a reputation for my zest of action. Since this had paid off for them a few times already, they tended not to complain, and most of the time joined me on my exploits. This time, however, I decided to make the first trip alone. I checked in with the men on guard duty and went on my way, scurrying from one bush to the next. Only a short time later, I arrived at one of the British tanks, an American-made M4 Sherman. The vehicle had received a direct hit and burned up. The armour was blackened and still radiating warmth. The track's rubber blocks were molten from the heat. I decided to have a look into the turret. I climbed up the hull and looked into the inside through one of the hatches. The unfortunate crew was still there. Unrecognisably burnt up, the contorted bodies lay wedged into each other in the turret. Their heads and limbs were charred, their flesh burnt black and some of the bones were visible. An intense stench of burnt flesh filled the air. As I was standing on that tank and staring at the horror below, shells already started whistling in. Just as I had processed the sound, the first shell struck straight ahead of me. I immediately dropped down from the tank onto the ground and dug my fingers into the soil next to the tracks. The earth was shaking and chunks of it rained down on me. A British artillery observer had probably spotted me, as now shell after shell was coming down around me. Cursing my adventurousness, I endured the spectacle. Most obviously, the British had more than enough artillery ammunition 
and did not have to economize it like us. After a few minutes, the show was eventually over, and I slowly crawled back towards our positions on all fours. When I judged myself to be out of sight, I jumped up and zigzagged the last hundred paces. Out of breath and with a pale face, I was welcomed at our line. The whole thing had been watched from a distance, and as such, I was asked no further questions. In any case, I decided to put my plan to capture a tank on hold for the foreseeable future. On the next day, July 20th, 1944, I would celebrate my 23rd birthday, and I wanted to live to see it. On my birthday, I treated myself to a simple but long breakfast. Who knew when I would have time for something like that again? Late in the afternoon, we received news that left us all in surprise. An assassination of Adolf Hitler had been attempted. Varied rumours quickly spread around, none of which seemed reasonable enough to believe it. What was clear, however, was that the attack had to have been carried out by one of our side, since no one else would have had access to Hitler's closer surroundings. Hitler had survived the attack, albeit not without injury. I could not help but think, the war must indeed have turned in our opponent's favour if there are now attempts to attack Hitler from within our own ranks. In the middle of this whole situation, we received a new movement order. The British were again on the attack around Traun. It seemed like they were starting to break through. Our company was now to reinforce the weakened defenders there. In short order, the whole company had mounted up and was heading towards saint Pere, south of Troan. Bratz went ahead in a Kubelwagen with two runners. One of these messengers had orders to meet us shortly before our arrival to relay a situation report. The weather was bad, with light rain and darkness setting in. After a short drive we halted at Pont de la Rame Bridge. Here, as had been planned, the runner was standing, ready to brief us on the situation. Our vehicles were spaced tightly, and their drivers tried their best to get them into cover on the roadside as well as under the bridge. There was little room, and we also had to keep moving, and so all stayed close together. In the dark of night, the tension was palpable. The assassination attempt was on everybody's minds. Will all this soon be over? How would the end look for us? Like the end of the last great war? Would the Allies, assassination or not, be willing to negotiate at all? Or keep insisting on unconditional surrender? Judging by how fierce the Allies were fighting, I thought the latter option to be more realistic. Their demand for unconditional surrender. The word unconditional, however, made us resent this option. It would mean that all our sacrifices would have been in vain, and that we could expect another catastrophic peace treaty like after the last world war. All of this went through my mind as I disembarked from my gun carrier. The runner greeted me, and we went to a small house next to the bridge. Only inside did he light up his pocket lamp in order to not risk us getting spotted from afar while he showed me the way on a map. We had just closed the door when all of a sudden everything was covered in blazing light and the door was jolted open again. Almost the same instant there was a shock wave and the hard bang of an explosion. Both of us instinctively dropped prone near the wall. After a short minute, the artillery strike was over. We kept on lying on the floor for a few seconds, practically paralyzed. The door had been torn from its hinges and lay in the middle of the room. Smoke and dust crept in from the outside. I recognized the flaring of fires, and the first sounds reaching our ears did bode ill. Medics were called for. Ammunition was exploding. I stood up and ran out. What I saw was a chaos of burning vehicles, smoldering debris, and screaming men beyond description. The artillery had struck right in our midst. Soldiers were crawling out under the vehicles, their faces blackened. Others were nothing more but twisted husks of smoldering flesh and scraps of uniform. I hurried towards my self-propelled gun. Right before it I found one of my NCOs, his name was Herring, lying on the ground. One of his legs was hanging on his thigh only by a few muscle strands, and his blood was spreading around him in a large puddle. The man, however, was surprisingly collected. Bracing himself on an arm, he yelled commands towards the crew. Just as I kneeled down next to him, a medic arrived, who immediately tied off the upper leg and turned the lower one, 
which was protruding at an unnatural angle to align with the other one, as if rearranging this gruesome picture would make things better. Only when the NCO saw this, he became aware of his situation. His face abruptly turned white, and he sank down on his back. Everything is going to be all right. Hold on, before forcing myself to turn around. It was no good. My leadership was needed. I tried to bring some order in the chaos. I sent men from here to there, patted all of them on the shoulder and gave each a task. At the very first, we dragged the dead and wounded out from under the vehicles and made sure that the medics could do their job. Over time, we found ourselves again. It was obvious, however, that we had to get away as quickly as possible. After a few seemingly endless minutes, the situation was under control again. I counted four, dead and six wounded, some of them severely. Ten casualties. Considering our already reduced numbers, this was quite a lot. Sadly, the NCO had not been the only wounded of my anti-tank platoon. Another of my soldiers had been gravely wounded, but our company was still lucky under these circumstances. The self-propelled guns remained undamaged and only a few trucks had been destroyed. I ordered all to mount up, and led by the runner, we went ahead to St. Pere, with our dead and wounded, the survivors heavily battered. <coughs> Deploying our company at Troan was now out of the question for the time being, but we immediately started regrouping the gun crews. Our dead and wounded were picked up in the same night already by ambulances that carried them to the next field hospital. What eventually became of our wounded, we were not told. This was how July 20th, 1944, the day of the assassination attempt on the Führer, ended for us. Because of the events surrounding the artillery strike, this attempt completely faded into the background. Only days later would we come to grapple with it. One realization became more and more clear to me. If you want to leave this war alive, you need more than pure luck. Even today, many years later, I have had not a single birthday on which I do not have to think about this nightly slaughter at Pont de la Ramée. The British attack on Troan on July 20th was repulsed without us, but only under heaviest losses on our side. Slowly but steadily, a fatalistic mood set in everywhere. The enemy's material superiority was utterly ineffable. The weather had worsened over the course of July 20th, however, with the beginning of a long period of rain, which soon turned the loamy plains east of the Orne into a vast field of mud, preventing any further armoured advance. The following hours were characterised by artillery duels. As both sides did not want to give each other too much peace, they resolved to throwing shells at each other. For each and every one of our artillery shells, however, we got twenty back from the Tommies. Then we received more bad tidings. A salvo of our own artillery had come too short and hit right in our main battle line. Four soldiers could only be recovered dead. Not only could we barely return fire, but once we were actually firing, we also hit our own positions. Our men acknowledged this in silent resignation. Upon looking in their eyes, however, I could clearly see how much resentment they were trying to hide. Within these pauses in the direct combat, there were also signs of humanity. On the next day, we witnessed a ceasefire being spontaneously agreed on by both sides. Fighting around Tron and St. Pere, had been so fierce, there had been barely any time to recover the wounded. By now they were lying on the battlefield, unprotected, for hours, or even days. In the night, we could often hear their screams of lament coming from no man's land. Only when it ceased, we knew that it was over for the poor devil. Many only succumbed to their grievous wounds after days of agony. Their calling was almost too much to bear at night. No man who once hears it will ever forget it. At once, ambulances were driving up on the opposing lines, their sides marked with large red cross flags. Trusting our sense of fairness, they slowly closed in on our positions. Not a single shot was fired. Now, for a few hours, the guns were silent, and both sides recovered their dead and wounded in the pouring rain. The medics were helping each other wherever they could. Everyone was recovered, whether friend or foe. After this time, the British and their ambulances went off again. In one of them, an English officer was standing bold upright. Upon passing by, he saluted us. Later, I was told by one of our medics that the man was a British physician who, in summer 1939, 
right before the war, had been studying at Heidelberg, Germany. In the evening of July 21st, the horror caught up with us again. We were lying in the garden of Chateau Saint-Père, where we had installed our command post. Battalion command had put us into reserve due to our earlier losses. At the time, we were coordinating our possible uses at the front lines, when we were once again hit by an enemy artillery strike. The first shells whistled in, and before we knew it, we were already in the middle of a bombardment. Like a hunted hare, I ran through the exploding landscape up to the chateau and into its cellar. I had not been the only one to come up with that idea, and together with other soldiers we hurriedly funneled down the stairs. Once we were down there, we could listen to the roaring of British artillery shells striking all around the building. The chateau basement was only half below the surface, and once the high cellar windows were smashed open, dust blown up by impacting projectiles was creeping in. The noise was deafening and almost unbearable. When the pressure of a detonation coming through the cellar window staggered me, I spread my arms to find something to hold on. Trying to regain my balance, I reached left and right, and suddenly my fingers encountered resistance by a sticky, warm something. Shocked, I looked to the side and saw how the soldier next to me fell down on his knees. A piece of shrapnel had whizzed through the window, cleanly splitting his head in two from the forehead upwards. My hand had grasped the inside of his head. I recoiled and stared eyes wide open on the twitching body that slowly vanished before me under a blanket of stirred-up dust and dirt. It seemed as if time was standing still for a blink of an eye. I threw myself into a corner and tried to be as flat as possible. After a few minutes, this bombardment came to an end as well. Almost trance-like, I stumbled towards the stairs. By now, I had seen quite a lot, but this had been nothing but pure horror. I tried to not look at the soldiers, who had been deadly hit, and climbed up the steps on all fours. The chateau and its garden had been hit bad. Half of the building's roof was gone, with the upper floor being almost completely exposed. Scraps of paper were falling down to the ground. I bent down and picked up a postcard. It depicted the chateau in its undestroyed state. What an irony of fate. Without giving it a second thought, I put the card into my pocket. In total, we suffered almost ten men killed. This was a shock. My guardian angel, as by now I was quite certain that I had to have one, had protected me from the worst once again. In contrast to the artillery strike at the bridge, my platoon did not suffer any casualties during this bombardment. At the bridge, I had lost two men to shrapnel, but this time we had enjoyed good cover. Only I had almost gotten it. In the meantime, I had received two new soldiers from Bratz. My anti-tank platoon was his strongest asset, and he did not want it to remain weakened. Thus I could reinforce my gun crews, and was now back to having 14 men under my command. These recent surprise fire attacks left us entirely convinced that the French resistance was keeping their eyes glued on us. How else could it be that we had been hit in such a targeted manner? We were not directly at the front line, camouflaged well in flat wooded terrain and the rainy weather did not allow for enemy aerial reconnaissance. Then, where did these targeted artillery strikes come from? We all were full of anger at the unknown enemy. The effects of this resentment would not be long in coming. After the bombardment, I stood together with my soldiers to assign them as gun crews when I saw an NCO of the company command squad approaching. Before him walked a French civilian, visibly scared to death. The sergeant had drawn his pistol and shoved the Frenchman, who must have been around 35 years old, in front of him. The man wore nothing but trousers and a shirt and had no papers with him. The two of them headed straight towards me. Dismissing my soldiers, I waited for the sergeant to come closer. The NCO was visibly agitated. Without letting me say anything, he panted out, Lieutenant, sir, we just apprehended this man. I was ordered to shoot him as a spy. Lieutenant, sir, I can't do this. I am sorry, but I simply can't do it. I had thought long about a situation like that. I went closer to the sergeant, pulled him to the side and sternly told him, Listen to me. You will take this man now, go to the edge of the village, and after the last house you look around and find out if anyone can still see you. Then you send the man away. Make him understand that he is free to go. Once he is away, 
You return to me and report the execution. Understood. With wide eyes, the NCO stared at me, dumbfounded, but also delighted. He confirmed my order with the words, Yes, Lieutenant, sir, turned around and went off with his prisoner. I took a deep breath and waited. After some minutes, the sergeant returned, somewhat insecurely reporting, order carried out, before disappearing again. Much relieved, I called for my soldiers again. However, one might think about this situation. I am convinced to this day to have done the right thing. Even if the civilian had been a resistance member, how could it have been proven? I think that my men knew all too well what I had said to the NCO, but none of them ever brought it up. And perhaps, deep inside, they approved of how their lieutenant had handled that situation. Any of them could have reported my actions just like that, but no one did. They stuck with me. Who had ordered the sergeant to shoot the man, I do not know to this day. It could not have been First Lieutenant Bratz. I had always witnessed him to be very correct. Those two artillery strikes and the resulting high losses had been too much for all of us, however. The nerves of everyone were strained. Maybe there had been actual evidence regarding the Frenchman. I do not know, and I will never find out. In times of war, the line between personal guilt and innocence is only a thin one.